Welcome everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are joining us from. And thank you for joining us for how to apply best practices from site reliability engineering in your organization, presented by CTO Universe and sponsored by Blameless. I'm Brittany, the site manager of CTO Universe, and I'm really excited to be bringing you this session with hard-earned insight on achieving production excellence through SRE. I'm really looking forward to talking with our guest, Liz Fong Jones today, and what I'm confident will be an interesting and amusing conversation. And we will be recording this webinar in case you have to leave early. Before we go any further, I want to thank Blameless for sponsoring the webinar and helping us to make this happen. If you haven't heard of Blameless, the site reliability engineering company, they offer the industry's leading go-to platform for SRE professionals. Blameless's complete SRE platform enables its users to automatically analyze and optimize business risks and outcomes, resulting in the perfect balance between reliability and innovation. Thanks again, Blameless. On that note, please feel free to ask questions during today's session. You can do so by submitting them into the questions panel on the right side of your screen. We'll try to answer as many of them as we can at the end of the presentation, so be sure to write in any questions that come up while Liz presents. My lovely colleague Maria will be fielding your questions today. She'll be happy to answer any questions you might have, so pull up the questions panel right now and say hello to let her know that you're listening to us. Throughout the webinar, we'll also be asking you to participate by raising your hand. You can raise your hand by pressing the button on the right side of your screen that looks like a little hand with an arrow pointing into the palm. Lastly, if you have any audio issues during today's presentation, you may wish to dial in by phone. You can do so by selecting the more button in the upper right portion of your screen and then select the switch to phone option. So today I'm really excited to be talking with Liz Fong Jones, who is one of the world's foremost thought leaders on site reliability engineering. Liz is a developer advocate, labor and ethics organizer and site reliability engineer with, 15, with over 15 years of experience. She's an advocate at Honeycomb for the SRE and observability communities, and previously was an SRE at Google, where she worked on products ranging from the Google Cloud Load Balancer to Google Flights. In addition to her expertise in the tech industry, Liz also plays classical piano, leads an EVE Online Alliance, and advocates for transgender rights as a board member for the National Center for Transgender Equality. So without any further ado, please take it away, Liz. Hi, thanks for joining me today. So today I wanted to talk about some of the lessons that I learned from my 11 years working at Google as a site reliability engineer, how those relate to the years that I spent prior to that as a game, uh, as a game operations engineer, and what I do today with Honeycomb and with the practices that I've learned from Google in order to help companies bring SRE practices into their organizations. So on our teams as leadership, we try to get our teams to solve problems for us. And most of the time, the way that they do that is that they write code. However, I think that all of us would agree that your team's job is not done when they commit the code into Git. That there's a lot more work that has to go into running a reliable service. Our production systems are increasingly complex, and that happens both from unintentional complexity, as well as from complexity that we need to thoughtfully add and cultivate in our systems. And it's especially more difficult when you add in technologies from cloud natives, such as Kubernetes or chaos engineering, or if you're straddling those worlds and operating in a hybrid environment. So we need practices such as those from DevOps and site reliability engineering to help us cope as engineering leaders and ensure that our organizations are able to maintain appropriate reliability and velocity levels. But it's really, really tricky to understand as someone who might be from outside the discipline, which parts do you implement? How do I get started with site reliability engineering inside of my organization? What parts of it only work at Google? Do I really need to have a thousand engineers in my organization to successfully implement SRE? Can I do this in a team with six people? How do I actually get my first team adopting SRE practices? A lot of these questions boil down to the issue of who has production ownership? Who is accountable for making sure that production runs smoothly? Often, you hear people asking that you make your product development software engineers responsible for production and give them the production ownership. Other times, you'll hear people saying that, no, your site reliability engineering team should be staffed to have production ownership. So in this talk, we're going to go into some of the detail of how you actually foster production ownership and, in fact, production excellence among whichever team members wind up being the most appropriate for your organization to implement SRE practices. 
one of the main challenges of running modern production systems is staying proactive and staying on top of all of the challenges that the business is throwing at you, while at the same time making sure that you're managing the uptime of your service and that you're managing the long-term sustainability of your service and preventing manual work from overwhelming everything that you're doing. But let's dive in a little bit and talk about what uptime actually means. I think that in order to have an understanding of site reliability engineering, we need to focus on the word reliability and really understand what that means in today's context. One way of measuring uptime certainly is in servers. Certainly when I was a game engineer 15 years ago, it was a lot simpler. If I could ping my game server, my one game server, I knew the production environment was up. I would have Nagios alerts go off. I would maybe have a single black box prober that would ping my server and make sure it was able to connect. But it was a simple binary yes or no answer to whether or not my servers were up. And fortunately, today's systems don't have that property. We cannot measure uptime in servers anymore because our services are scattered across so many distinct microservices, servers, and individual user shards such that this no longer is a meaningful metric. So what about looking at user complaints? I would argue that yes, user complaints can be a helpful predictor of when you are going to be receiving that phone call as a CTO from your CEO asking, hey, what's going on with the site? Why are my most important customers calling me on my cell phone now? But I think that we need to be much more proactive than that. And what we need to catch issues before customers become so noisily upset that they're calling your boss, your CEO, and asking you that they're going to give up and, uh, and demand a refund if you don't improve the quality of your service. So I don't think we can manage the quality of our service by, by complaints alone either. And then we have to stay on top of delivering features because that's what we're here to do, right? We're here in order to deliver products to our customers. So I think that this is kind of the tightrope that many of us walk as engineering leaders trying to navigate these challenges of running modern complex systems. So in order to address these challenges, we need to adopt different strategies. And we need to not just move past the strategies from 10 or 15 years ago, we also need to pick the best strategies from SRE and modern DevOps in order to drive our organizations going forward. Because what we're doing today in many organizations isn't working well for us. So what can we do? What ought we to do? I would argue that one common anti-pattern I see people doing is I see people trying to buy their way out of the problem to try to buy a pile of tools in order to help them adopt a more DevOpsy culture. I think this is a mistake. Here's what happens if you try to buy DevOps. If you order things out of the alphabet soup and you get the entire alphabet soup and you're deploying things as quickly as possible with your new shiny continuous integration delivery system, but no one's actually checking on the quality, then you're just shipping shit as fast as you can without actually making sure that it meets user needs. If you have infrastructure as code, now instead of one bad commit or command taking your server down, instead, one bad commit can take your entire production infrastructure across your entire cloud down. So maybe that's not necessarily something you need right this instant. And Kubernetes, right? Like, you know, Everyone's talking about Kubernetes. Do you actually need it? Well, I do. if your attitude is, I don't know, let's try it anyways, you know, you're just adding additional complexity. And complexity is really, really painful for your engineers. And if you adopt the attitude of production ownership and just put your teams directly on call without equipping them with any tools to cope, they're going to be in a world of pain. Don't just throw people directly into a pager duty rotation, expect things to magically get better. Instead, things will get worse right away. Here's the reason why. If you wire up every possible alert in your system to your pagers, and you put those pagers on the belts of engineers who don't know necessarily how to tame the noise, you're going to have people who are getting woken up at all hours of the night who cannot possibly be creative during the day and get more and more grumpy, and they'll eventually churn and quit. And even when you do get someone who feels like, okay, I'm going to start investigating this incident rather than turning off my pager, if you bought 
a dashboard or a set of dashboards from a monitoring vendor, they're going to add more noise and signal because it's hard to tell when you're looking at 20 different pages of dashboards, each with 20 graphs on them, where do I even start looking here? How do I actually understand what's going on? And it goes even beyond the problem of a MySQL graph that someone has generated because they detected you at a MySQL service. What about the graph that your lead engineer added five incidents ago because they said, aha, our postmortem action item is to add a dashboard to cover this case. And then the next time this happens, we'll immediately be able to tell. No, you won't. You won't actually go and look on that particular dashboard, or by the time you do, it'll be 20 minutes later. So all of this is to say that your time to recover from incidents gets longer and longer, and users are kept waiting longer and longer because you can't figure out what's going on inside of your systems. And finally, you wind up in a situation where you as CTO are the, are the responder of last resort, or maybe it's even responder of first resort. Raise your hand, tell me, how many of you are the expert on your team still? Even though you're CTO, even though you've kind of, you've got a VPN, maybe, maybe you've got managers, maybe you've got like, you know, dozens of engineers. How many of you are still the expert on your team, the expert who understands how your systems are built? And again, you can raise your right. hand by using the little button that's on the right side of the screen. It looks like so far we have about 10% of our audience saying they are still the expert. Yeah, so if you're in that set, uh, then you wind up, uh, Brittany, you need to mute, sorry. If you're in that set of people, right, like you wind up feeling like you're the bottleneck, right, that you are holding back your teams from resolving incidents, but you don't have the time to tell your team and get all this knowledge out of your head, right? It's a really pernicious state. And it's really, really painful. And even when you don't have your pager constantly on fire, when you try to continuously deliver, what happens is your unit and integration tests are only covering small pieces of your system. And it turns out that it doesn't matter how good each component in your system is, this robot cannot walk because the joints between the components are broken, right? Mm -hmm. And that's a good analogy for what happens inside mm -hmm. of our systems when we just retrofit continuous delivery onto a platform where we don't do thorough testing of how things are actually going to behave in production. So your team finds and you find that there's not really that much time to do projects because you've handed them pager, it's constantly on fire, they're resolving incidents or taking a long time to resolve incidents, and they're not really finding time to fit in between their feature work, between their on-calls, reliability work. And even if they do find like an hour or two, if you don't articulate for them as a CTO what the plan is for how you're coding, for how you're getting yourself out of here, then your engineers are going to be completely lost. They're not going to be able to understand how do I, with an hour or two, chip away at this problem of my pager being on fire. Does this sound familiar? Is your team struggling to hold on? Tell, tell me, am I, am I, uh, is this resonating with you? Raise your hand if you, if you think that this is resonating with you. Your pager's on fire, your team's struggling to hold on. Uh, the number's still increasing, but right now we're at like 30%. <laughs> Good. Okay. Great. I'm glad this is something that hopefully is, is something that I can help you with. So I've seen a lot of teams go through this situation, uh, both in my time at Google, where yes, operational overload is a thing that Google S3 teams struggle with, as well as in my consulting role, in my role helping customers of Google Cloud as a customer reliability engineer at Google. And now in my role at Honeycomb, I see this happen all the time. And I have answers for you. And the answer is that we need to stop and take a breath and zoom out and look at what are we missing? What approach did we fail to account for when we got ourselves into this mess? I think what we need to do is we need to look at who operates our systems. It's the people who operate our systems, right? It's people who come to work every day and come work for us as the leaders of an engineering organization. Those are the people that we need to put first before we can really go and try to put out fires and help our users, right? The thing that they have on an airplane is so true, right? Put on your oxygen mask before you try to help others, right? So put on your oxygen mask, your team's oxygen mask, and let's look at how we can actually address these problems. I think that we need to stop adopting a tools first mindset, right? Our systems are not just technical systems anymore. 
what we have is a socio-technical system. It's the combination of your people and of your software systems. And the challenge of having software and automation is that software and automation can help you can help you with a workflow that you already know how to do or that you're already starting to progress along. It can nudge you, it can guide you, but it cannot reverse the DNA of your organization, right? You cannot buy a tool, even a wonderful tool like Blameless, right? You cannot buy that tool and expect it to magically work. You have to be willing to put in that work and you have to be willing to invest in your people, culture, and process in order for the tooling to be able to help you. So that's what we're here to talk about today. We're here to talk about production excellence, which is when we apply our people, process, and culture in order to make our teams better and make our systems more resilient. The goal that I have with production excellence is not just to make systems more reliable, but also to make our systems more friendly. Production excellence is a skill set, it's a capability, it's a mindset that you can build on your team. It's not just something that you hand to someone and say, congratulations, you have a pager, now you're the production owner. That's not what this is about. We have to plan, right? We have to do more than just hand someone a pager. We have to develop a roadmap, we have to figure out how are we developing along this road and what signposts should I be looking for along the way? And one of the signposts that I want to talk about in particular is how can you explain to your business unit? How can you explain to your CEO why we're doing this, how we can know when it's better? And I think that kind of the number one metric of this is what's your level of reliability and what's the level of churn within your organization? And that enables us to measure and act on what matters. We also cannot approach this using an engineering only mindset. In particular, as I'm going to go into later in this presentation, reliability is a facet of the product. Therefore, you cannot approach this purely from an engineering standpoint. If you have a chief product officer, or if you have a product management organization, you should involve them. You should involve your customer success or your sales teams, right? You need to know when your customers are happy. And you need to involve kind of the business and the CFO and your CEO in the finances of this, right? This is not an effort that you can approach alone by yourself. This is a collaborative cross-team effort. And it relies upon collaboration. It relies upon you fostering a culture of psychological safety on your team and making sure that people feel comfortable asking questions and raising issues and otherwise surfacing things that are impairing your ability to deliver an excellent production service. So that was a lot. How do I actually get started? I'm going to argue to you today that there are four things that you need to do as a CTO in order to have your teams achieve production excellence. The first one of which is you need to know when your systems are too broken. I'm going to get, get back to the point of too broken in a moment, but, but you need to know when your systems are too broken. And when they are too broken, you need to be able to debug and effectively resolve your incidents in collaboration with other teams when things are too broken. And finally, we need to close that feedback loop. We need to eliminate unnecessary complexity. Of course it's true that when you add new features, you need to add complexity, right? That's an essential facet of our business. But there's technical debt and unnecessary complexity that accumulates along the way. Maybe the thing that served you two years ago is not necessarily a thing that's going to serve you now. So we need to continuously revisit the decisions that we've made in order to make sure that one-wave outages, we're resolving them and proactively hardening our systems. So those are the four things being able to understand when things are too broken, debugging together, and eliminating the unnecessary complexity and closing that feedback loop. So that's what I'm going to tell you about today. So let's focus on that aspect of when things are too broken. Why did I say too broken? The answer is that our systems are always failing in some way. And like that mythical server that I had when I was a wee sysadmin 15 years ago, right? Our systems are always failing in some small facet. You have timeouts happening somewhere in your system. Some small fraction of a percent of your queries are failing. This is probably actually okay, right? Our goal is not to deliver a perfect service. Our goal is to deliver service that's good enough. Similarly, if you have a lot in front of your house, right, how many of you expect every single leaf of grass in that lawn to be green 100% of the time? Probably none of you, right? So, so similarly, we should not expect all of our systems to be 100% up all the time. 
So instead, we need to measure what the actual failure rate is and compare against what our expected failure rate is. And that'll give us a signal of whether this is business as normal or whether we need to intervene as an engineering team. So we need to measure two broken. And to do this, we're going to use one of the cornerstone practices of site reliability engineering. If you're going to take away one practice from site reliability engineering, this is one of them. A service level indicator and its counterpart, the service level objective, is common language between you and your business. It allows you to communicate about expectations about reliability and expectations about the level to which features will be available in a way that your engineers can understand, you can understand, and your business can understand. The way that we measure a, a service level objective is that we need to think about what a user journey looks like. What is one event that encapsulates the outcome of a user journey? And what's the additional context? What's the additional metadata that goes along with it? Maybe it's the list of microservices that, that it went through. Maybe it's the list of versions of software that it went through. Maybe it's the request ID. Maybe it's which content the user is from. Maybe it's the user ID. But there are so many different properties of these requests that can be helpful to us in identifying what's going on inside our systems and are users disproportionately impacted. But we can't sit there and look by hand through all of these events through, scrolling through our system. Instead, we have to teach our systems to understand what a good and what a bad user experience looks like. And frequently, this is where the collaboration aspect comes in, right? Like your product managers or your customer success team often know what symptoms tend to correlate with unhappy users. And then what we can do is we can define a threshold to bucket events into good or bad. For example, let's suppose that I'm running a website where I can buy items similar to Etsy, right? What I might want to check is, can people successfully view the homepage? Am I serving any errors or am I returning HTTP code 200? And is the latency fast enough that users are not closing the tab and giving up in frustration because they're tired of waiting, along, waiting too long? So that might mean that a good interaction is when I served an HTTP 200 in less than 300 milliseconds and also, you know, by the way, all these common sense things like, yes, the page has items on it, right? A, a page that, a home page that returns zero items for you to buy is probably not a good experience. And then we can look over a long period of time and see how many eligible events did I see, right? That 403 that I served to a botnet saying, hey, you're not allowed to shop here, like, you know, go away, you're a robot, right? That's not an eligible event. Nor is, for the moment, an event like an individual microservice call within that stack, right? What I'm interested in is the high level view of how many real customer interactions my service encountered. And now hopefully you can start to understand why this is a valuable thing that your business might want you to measure. And hopefully it's also clear how this is distinct from those high level dashboards that you tend to get out of metrics providers that show you the number of total requests across all your endpoints, right? We care about very specific endpoints, and we should measure those user journeys that our customer success and product people identify. So then our availability number is the number of good events divided by eligible events, and we can set a target on it. And we can say, for instance, that we aim to achieve 99.9% .9 of requests succeeding to the homepage of my shopping site over, for instance, a 30-day window. Why did I say a 30-day window? Well, how would your CEO feel if you came to them and you said, we were 100% down yesterday, but we're 100% up today and you can forget about yesterday. That, that's in the past. Like we're, we're doing 100% up today, right? Your CEO would not be very happy with you. I can tell you that. So we have to look at longer cadences, mm -hmm. similar to the roadmaps with which we plan, right? You probably have six week or 30 day or like 90 day sprints or OKR planning cycles, right? So think about the cycles that you use to plan your engineering work, as well as the memory of your customers. Your customers are probably going to remember, you know, maybe slightly if they had to hit refresh and shrug, you know, yesterday. They're not going to remember that two months from now. So a good SLO just barely keeps your users happy. If you aim for 100%, you are making a bad trade-off 
because you are prioritizing excessive reliability that your customers are never going to notice in favor of actually delivering agility and features to your business, right? So our goal should be to adopt the S3 practice of moving as fast as we can while maintaining sufficient reliability to keep our users happy. It's okay for me to have to refresh my app, right? If I'm trying to load a boarding pass, maybe my Wi-Fi cut out, right? It doesn't matter if the American Airlines boarding pass service is 100% up, if my Wi-Fi is 99% available, right? So we have to target the right level of availability. And once we define these targets, what can we do? Well, I argue there are two things that you can immediately do that will help put out fires in your team. The first one of which is we can switch to driving our alerting with our service level objectives. Now, I know some, some of you may have the objection. Liz, you're asking me to add more alerts? No, not quite. What I'm asking you to do is consider how many errors you're allowed to serve to your customers. If I have a target of having one in a thousand homepage loads fail at most and 999 out of a thousand homepage loads succeed, that means if I serve 100 million requests per month, that means that I am allowed one in a thousand or 100,000 errors to occur during a rolling 30-day window. And that means that I can do computations, like look at if I am serving a thousand errors per minute, that means I have a hundred minutes until I run of my error budget, right? So I can either serve, you know, if I'm serving a thousand errors per minute, you know, maybe that's something that I need to address within the next two hours or else people are going to become really, really grumpy. If I'm serving a thousand errors per day, I've got 10 days to react, right? Like that's plenty of time. I no longer need to wake up my engineers the moment anything goes slightly wrong in the system, right? I only need to wake up engineers if I'm going to exhaust my error budget and have my CEO be unhappy at me or my customers be unhappy at me within hours. Otherwise, it can wait till business hours or not even alert, right? Because a hard disk going from 89.9% .9 full to 90% full, that's not an emergency. Yet many of us unfortunately treat that as an emergency, and I think that's a mistake. The second thing that you can do is you can now come to your business decision makers and say, you know what, we agree on a reliability target and we're doing fine on reliability. Guess what? I would like to embrace more risk. Would you like to do that A-B test? Today is a great day to do that A-B test because we've exhausted only 10% of our error budget. Go ahead, do that A-B test. Let, let's find out what happens. And that's okay, that's safe because we've decided what a safe reliability level is. And as long as we have things like feature flags to let us roll back quickly, it limits the damage and allows us to say, you know what, yes, this, this is a safe experiment to run. The other argument is like, if you had a set of bad outages, well, you can say to the product manager who's bugging you and saying, hey, you know, we need this feature yesterday, is to say, you know what, we came to an agreement as an entire business that when the reliability level gets less than 99.9%, we need to slow down. We need to go and fortify our sites so that we aren't down again soon or else it doesn't matter how many great features we ship if no one trusts our site and visits it because they think it's always down. So, you know, I think that SLOs can frequently feel like they're aspirational, can frequently feel like it's out of reach. And my answer to you is start somewhere because what you don't know is hurting you. Whereas what you are measuring, you know how much it's hurting you, right? And I think that it's important to not focus on getting a perfect SLO and instead refining over time. Many of us have things like load balancer logs. Load balancer logs are great. They're well structured. They contain some metadata and they have information like response codes, like latency, right? So measure what you can today. You don't have to adopt today a client-based uh, solution that enables at real user monitoring. You don't need that right now. If you're not measuring anything, start with your ALB logs. Start with your uh, Google Cloud Load Balancer logs. Start somewhere. And then yes, you can iterate to meet user needs. And there are two flavors of this. One flavor says, you know what? We had our paging go off, but not a single, not a single important customer complained or called. Maybe that, that's set too strict. Or conversely, if your customers are calling, but your service level objective is green, don't be Mr. Burns. Don't say like, you know, oh, it's the children who are wrong, right? Like, no, like you, you got to make your SLO adapt to fit the needs of your, of your actual customers. And that might mean adding more endpoints to the set of things you consider within your SLO. Maybe that means measuring closer to the user. 
But those are things you can address later. The important thing is to measure and have a yardstick to start from. And this enables you to alert on what matters and make the right business decisions about when it's time to speed up or slow down. But SLIs and SLOs, as I was telling you at the beginning, they're only half the picture, right? They only tell you when things are too broken. They don't help you debug. We have to be able to debug our systems in production. Because our outages are never one and identical and the same. If they were, we would not be doing our job as engineers, right? Like, you know, yes, if you let your system fail in the same way at 5 p.m. on every single Friday, you know what? You probably should not be the CTO, right? Our outages are never the same because we're constantly fixing the outages that we know about, and we always are operating in the realm of the unknown unknowns rather than the known unknowns. We can't predict in advance every single possible failure mode. We have to be able to understand what's going on inside of our real systems and understand in production. Your CEO would probably not take it as a good answer if you told them, you know what? We're going to have to let this customer suffer for weeks while we try to reproduce their issue in staging, right? That's not a satisfying answer people like to hear, right? We have to be able to take apart our systems and understand what's happening with them while they're actually running and understand what the behavior is of real customers inside of our systems. And in particular, one thing that I found uh, in my time as a site reliability engineer at Google was that most of my time when I was firefighting was spent forming and testing hypotheses. My pager goes off and I immediately go to, what do I think is wrong? And how can I verify that that's actually the problem that I need to fix in order to mitigate this outage? And this really in, requires us to be able to ask new questions of our data. It doesn't matter how much data we have if we cannot ask the questions that we need in order to understand what's going on in our systems, both for proactive understanding as well as during break, fix, repair. So all of this is to say that our services have to be observable. They have to have observability. Now, the textbook definition of, of observability says that your services are observable if you can understand purely from the outputs of the system what's going on with the internal state of the system. But I think a more workable definition is can I, without pushing new code, understand for the telemetry my system is emitting and from, the, from my ability to query that system, can I answer questions about my service? And can I understand those properties, right, that I talked about earlier, things like which user IDs are impacted, which endpoints are impacted, which user agents, which services or combinations of services are in the critical path? And can we explain the variance between the requests that are successful that are meeting our service level indicator and those that are violating our service level indicator and contributing negatively to our service level objectives. And that's the kind of question that I need to be able to ask and answer while I'm on call, while I'm responding to an incident. And better yet, do I have to watch this happen in production? Or can I automatically roll back the bad release? Can I automatically drain the bad availability zone? Can I debug this later during business hours using the telemetry that's already been collected for me? But observability really goes beyond break fix. It's not just about your operational resilience. It's also about four other things. Can you actually use the same tools that you use in order to understand your production environment and start testing those assumptions early when you're doing code development? Can you have visibility and observability into your build pipeline? Do you know why your builds take one hour or two hours or three days, right? Do you know? Do you have predictability in if I land a commit today, will it be out tomorrow? And can I actually understand how user, users are using my features, right? Am I actually building impactful things or am I building things that users are not clicking on? And am I actually proactively managing that technical debt? Those are some of the considerations that we need to keep in mind about the kinds of questions that our systems need to be able to answer for them to be observable. Observability is also not just the data. It's not logs, traces, and metrics. Instead, it's about the entire system. Do you have usable instrumentation that your developers can use to add data to the systems that they're developing? Can you store the data in a cost-efficient manner, whether it's logs, metrics, traces, or something else? And can you query? Can you actually ask those questions that you need to answer at runtime? So SLOs and observability go together. One lets you know when are things too broken, the other one lets you proactively manage your service and understand when things are too broken, how do I fix it? But you also need collaboration between teams in order to have production excellence. And that's the third thing I'm telling you about today. You cannot run a team purely on heroism. 
heroism is a really bad recipe for running a team. Because if you are in that 10% of people that a CTO, CTO who's a hero, when was the last time you took a vacation? Do you feel you could take a vacation for a month? You know, sure, I'll give you like two months to plan. Can you take a vacation for, for a month, two months from now? Raise your hand if you think you could go on vacation for a month, turn off your page or turn off your phone. How many of you think you could, you could actually do that? Raise your hand. We have three hands raised. <laughs> Yeah, right, like it's not sustainable to be a hero. You as a CTO are entitled to go on vacation. So is your lead engineer. So our debugging cannot be a solo activity. You cannot have debugging be a specialist skill that only one person or two people on your team know. Everyone on your team has to be at, at least a certain minimum level of debugging to have effective production ownership. Otherwise, what you have is not actually production ownership. What you have is you have the pager, but you're not actually empowered to actually own it and do anything about it, right? So we have to collaborate, we have to share that knowledge. And we have to work across organizational boundaries. We have to work with the customer success team, we have to work with uh, our cloud provider or our cloud or our data center ops team, right? Debugging is really for everyone. We all have to work together. And that means that we have to raise concerns to each other, we have to talk things through. It's not okay to say to someone, I can't believe you didn't know that, Ben, right? That's not okay, right? We have to say, you know what? Thank you for raising that, Ben. I'm sorry our documentation wasn't clear. Let's work on improving the documentation together, right? So much better. The other thing is that if our teams are not functioning effectively together, then we're not doing a good job as leaders, right? We have to be able to work together as entire teams. We cannot have people on call 24 seven or 24 365, right? One person cannot be on call 24 seven 365. You have to be able to allocate responsibilities between your team members. If you're a manager, do you really want to be on call and get paged in the middle of delivering someone's performance evaluation? I think not, right? For managers, often it's most important to have your daytimes free in order to make sure that you don't get interrupted in the middle of important people conversations. You probably also have teammates who don't work on Shabbat, right? You probably should not make sure, you, sorry, you probably should not have rely on team members to do a full week of on call Least of all, if they have a religious reason why they don't work from Friday at sundown to Saturday at sundown, right? So on-call is a collective responsibility. It means we have to do it together, not that we have to do it all alone. So schedule your on-call in a humane manner. Make sure that people can rotate in and out. And also, make sure that people are writing down what they learn along the way, right? We learn best when we document, and document the right amount. Don't document too, too much, right? Documentation that's stale and misleading from three years ago is not helpful, but knowing how do I put out the fire today, that's really, really important. That's what we should be teaching people to do. And that means that we also have to share that knowledge out, right? Like if you're that hero, every time someone asks you for something, help write down an answer together in documentation rather than keeping it locked up in your head and being asked the same question over and over and over again. And make sure that you don't have a culture in, in your teams of, you know, saying, oh, it looks great on my dashboard. I don't see your problem, right? Make sure you're using the same common language, the same common tooling. Make sure if you have a service level objective, everyone agrees on it and understands how is it measured. And make sure you actually reward people, right? You know, have a hashtag love channel, right? Like where people say, hey, thanks, Ben. I really appreciated that you spent the time to work with me on that pull request yesterday, right? Or, hey, thanks for helping with that, with that uh, outage. That really, really encourages people to step up and work together and contribute rather than being lone wolves. The other element is that we don't just collaborate with our current coworkers, we collaborate with our future selves as well. We have to learn from the past in order to reward our future self and learn from our outages. Because our outages don't necessarily exactly repeat, but they're, they rhyme, they're common patterns, right? And many of you as CTOs know this, right? Like, you know, you got to where you are because you lived through enough both engineering disasters, team disasters, technical disasters, right? Like you've seen it all, right? So how do you pattern match, right? How can we teach other people to pattern match and how can we be proactive about saying, oh, it's about that time in the movie where the monster jumps out. We better do something about that, right? So we have to do risk analysis. We have to do technical risk analysis to help us plan. What's involved in that? Well, you know, some of you may live in the San Francisco Bay Area. Some of you may have had some earthquakes recently. Let's suppose that you know you had a bridge that's been damaged by an earthquake. There are now cars that have fallen through the road deck. 
And, you know, yes, the columns of the bridge also need an earthquake retrofit, and yes, it needs a fresh coat of paint. Which one of those would you address first? Let's stop the cars from falling to the deck, let's do the earthquake retrofit, and then let's paint it a shiny purple color or argue about the bike shed, right? So do this with a reliability lens. We need to think about how often do outages happen and how bad is the impact? So the frequency with the outages happen is often referred to as the time between failures, and it's the thing that we have the least control over. In general, you can't control how often something happens, but it's something to keep in mind of trying to address the things that happen every single day and considering them to be important just as much as you consider planning for the big one to be important. Impact though, impact is a very, very rich area because impact is measured in terms of how many people were affected and how long did the outage last? And you have a lot of control over that. Do we have to push to 100% of our users all the time? At, you know, when we first released a binary, no, right? You can scale that potential impact of an outage to 1% from 100%, and that gives you 100 times more error budget to play with with that outage, right? Or what if you could shrink your response time from two hours to 30 minutes by adopting better incident response practice? Or what if you found out about outages sooner, and then you, ha you were able to start responding sooner? Those are all variables that we can play with. And then we can look at which risks are the most significant in terms of the total expected impact over a longer period of time. Like how many failed user interactions per year does this risk generate based off of patterns we've seen before? Even if they're approximate, it's a good idea of what might I want to work on. And this is something I learned two weeks ago. There is a rich discipline around fault analysis and systems analysis in order to understand what possible failure modes are. And these apply to situations where you can't just do it again, right? Where things, you have things like space shuttles, where you have things like nuclear reactors, right? Where you can't just throw in the prod and then try again if it fails, right? And there you have the discipline of systems theoretic process analysis and fault tree analysis that can help you understand what is the risk probability here and what should I do about it? So which risks should you address? You should risk any risk that threatens your SLO. So if I know that I'm allowed 100,000 bad events per month, if I have a single risk that's consuming 25,000 bad events per, per month on average, that's something I want to do about. Because in addition to the budget of all the risks that I can account for, I need to make sure that there's plenty of room for risks that I haven't yet accounted for. And that's important to leave room for. So any risk that pushes us over kind of 75% of our SLO, or any risk that singly is more than 25% of our error budget, that's probably something we might want to address. And now you're equipped with the business case to fix them, to say, we agreed on this is my target reliability level. This is the set of risks that impair us from being able to achieve it. So it doesn't matter what new features you want to deliver, because if we don't get these pieces of technical debt under control, then we're going to be in trouble. And then we can actually prioritize completing the work. And that doesn't mean completing the work in order of first in, first out. I think you need to do a risk analysis every now and then, right? Like don't throw every single item from your postmortems into the list of work you have to do. Then it just grows forever and forever, right? Instead, we have to look at what's the most important risk that I should be addressing with a fraction of my team's time. And how do I increase the fraction of my team's time that's devoted to reliability work if I start having my error budget be in danger? Do not spend your time chrome polishing. Do not ad ad adopt Kubernetes just because you heard about it and it's fun, right? Or some engineer wanted to do as their pet project. Focus on the impact. What is the thing that is causing your customers to potentially be unhappy? What's the things that are going to be most impactful future-wise? Work on those things. Don't work on hypothetical reliability improvements that only affect a tiny fraction of a fraction of a percent of users, unless that's the availability level you're aiming for. But when people are doing risk analysis, I find that they tend to omit two major categories that affect every single risk. One of those is a lack of observability. If every single outage that you have takes an extra 20 minutes or two hours to resolve because you cannot figure out what's going on inside of your complex system, that's a lack of observability. And it means that every outage is increased by two hours. And that means that you are burning through a lot more of your error budget than you need to. So focus on making across the board improvements to observability, and you'll find that your reliability improves because your time to recover from incidents improves. The other category they want to highlight is lack of collaboration as a killer. 
I talked to a team the other day where a support team was trying to raise an issue saying that, hey, everyone that is using Safari on Mac is not able to access our website. It took two weeks in order for that issue to be surfaced to engineering and for it to be declared an incident. Two weeks, right? We have to be comfortable raising our hand and saying, you know what? This is an important issue. I think it needs to be raised to the awareness of other teams rather than keeping your mouth shut because you're afraid that somebody's going to yell at you or blame you. Or another example is um, during the large Google Cloud Platform networking outage from, from July of 2018. It turns out that when you celebrate people for raising their hand and saying, yeah, that was my push that broke it, right? That's, that improves time to response, right? That single-handedly improves our time to respond because the engineer who had broken the networking stack said, this is my change, I'm rolling it back, right? Instead of being afraid to raise your hand and, and instead waiting for someone else to discover it. So you don't have to be a hero in order to have success with your engineering team. You don't have to demand that engineers on your team sacrifice their lives in order to have the, your site be available. Instead, if you adopt the right set of S3 practices, namely the production excellence practices of service level objectives, observability, collaboration, and risk analysis, then you'll have a much healthier team without necessarily having to hire a team of a dozen SREs. So yes, buy the right tools, and yes, Blameless is a great tool, and so is Honeycomb for that matter. But like, also think about what's the overall culture I'm trying to foster? Does this foster my goals? What am I doing to my team and its culture in order to make sure that the tool adoption and the evolution of my socio-technical system is going smoothly? So buy tools, season your soup with production excellence. Thank you. Perfect. Um, thank you so much, Liz. This is a, has been a fantastic presentation. Um, and we do have lots of time for questions. Um, and before we dive into them, I just want to remind everyone that the recording and slides for this session will be emailed to you within 48 hours of the webinar. Um, also, we will be sending out a brief feedback survey when you log off. So please help us to make our webinars better and tell us what you thought of today. All right, so um, kicking off the questions, um, this first question is, uh, as senior technical leaders, how do we get senior leadership and peers in the organization on board with aspects like SLOs? I think how we get people to buy into SLOs is to point out that it enables us to be much more proactive, that if we're measuring the same things that they are, that enables us to get on the same page, right? There's no longer the feedback loop of someone call, an angry customer calls uh, the support team, support team has to raise a takeover with engineering, right? Like, wouldn't it be better if we were proactively measuring it and then immediately doing something about it, right? I think that's kind of one, one aspect is talking about the collaboration aspects. The other aspect is to talk about the fact that, you know, outages are happening, errors are happening. We're not measuring them. It would be better if we measured them and knew what to do about them rather than just putting our heads in the sand, right? I think that that's kind of the right approach. When people say, when aim for 100%, the answer is 100% is not achievable unless you have an infinite budget. So let's pick a realistic target. Let's measure it together. Let's work towards it. Let's, let's kind of have agreement on it. And I think that that tends to answer people's concerns pretty well. Yeah, I think that's a, a fantastic answer. Um, and something that's kind of along a similar vein is, uh, how would you present this approach to other CC executives that have a less technical background? So how would you present it and sell it while still keeping your explanation uh, something that others can understand? I think we have to go back to that slide I presented about, you know, talk to your product managers, measure, measure customer journeys, right? Like I think even business folks speak in customer journeys, right? What's the customer trying to accomplish? Can we actually make sure that they're able to accomplish that? Can we understand when even if we're having, you know, only one in a thousand uh, requests are failing, if 100% of them are for one user, that user is really unhappy, right? If 100% if of their queries are failing and none of their counterparts are, right? So I think that that kind of lens of talking about customer experiences is something that we share in common with our non-technical counterparts. Definitely, definitely. And that just reinforces your entire point about collaboration and how important that is throughout this entire process. Um, yeah, right. Like, you know, you cannot do this in a vacuum. You have to learn from other business units and other executives what they care about, and then you can figure out how to measure it and help them. Yeah, definitely. Um, we had an audience member who followed up on that and asked, uh, how do you propagate the don't blame mindset? 
I think that that's something that definitely, you know, Blameless aims to help people with, right, in terms of saying, you know what, look, you get better results when you don't blame, right? You, you flat out get better results because you have shorter time to resolve because people feel like they're not going to get their fingers burned from, 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 from raising their hand and saying, hey, it was, it was my problem. Um, I think that it is a issue that has to be led from the top, right? Like if executives are finger pointing and blaming, that culture is going to carry down all the way through, right? So the first step is kind of for you as an engineering leadership to defend your team members if necessary, right? To say, you know what, that's not an appropriate question to ask or, you know, We'll cover that during the retrospective. Now during an incident is not the right time. I think that this is where, you know, a good incident management process, whether it's blameless or not, right, or sorry, whether it's using the product blameless or not, is good because it means that people know, talk to the communications lead, do not bug the operations lead, do not bug the person who's trying to fix the issue right now, right? If you try to yell at the person fixing the issue, it's going to take longer results. So I think those kinds of answers can be helpful. But I think overall, it does take a, a overall cultural shift, and that does require reinforcement that does require uh, people talking about psychological safety and talking about barriers to it. Yeah, definitely. The, uh, the audience member who asked that actually just said, ooh, good example, great answer. Um, so perfect. And another question that's actually very related to that last point about psychological safety, um, this audience member said that um, you touched on how important that is to achieve production excellence, um, and they want to know how you can measure whether or not your team members experience psychological safety in their work, and if they don't, how you can get started on cultivating that. Yeah, I think that I have my misgivings about how Google specifically defines psych safety. Um, in that Google defines psych safety as the freedom to express, like you know, one's opinion regardless of whether it's different from someone else's, right? I think that that definition of diversity-focused psych safety is a little bit counterproductive, but I think the more concrete SRE-focused psych safety is, you know, do I feel comfortable opening an incident, right? Do I feel comfortable, right, what happens if there's a false alarm? Do I feel comfortable that I'm not going to get yelled at, right? Um, do I feel like I have a good code review process, right? I think that often we see signs of bad, uh, of blameful culture in code reviews, right? If you have people belittling each other for lack of knowledge, right? I think that those are some useful warning signs even before you get to an outage itself. I think when you look at the outage itself, right, you have to look for like blame words happening during a retrospective. If someone asks, you know, who did that, right? Or, you know, or like what happened, right? As opposed to how did it happen? Or like, what did the people happen to think at the time, right? Like, because I think this is an, a very fruitful area that you know is almost its entirely own separate talk. I recommend looking at John Allspaw's work and uh, Will Gallego, uh, Will Gallego's work because they talk a lot about this idea of how do we make, how do we actually structure incident review as a learning process and not just just as a find someone to point the finger at process. Um, so I think those are some starting points. Is kind of look for blame words like why or look at, look at look for blame words like who right and focus on how and what instead. Um, so uh, article by John Oswald, the infinite uh, hows instead of instead of the five whys, super useful, look at that. Awesome, <laughs> love that we have some follow-up um, materials for people to, to read through to get more information there. Um, okay, we have a couple more questions. Um, so uh, somebody asked, how do we avoid the loudest complaints? Um, so for example, customers being the definition of reliable enough. I think it's defined by business risk, right? If your loudest complaint is a business risk, then maybe it is worth addressing. If your loudest complaint is not a business risk and you're willing to let the customer go because they're demanding something unreasonable, right? I think that's a grown up conversation to have of this customer is costing us too much money or this customer is, is like is a churn risk, but we're fine with it because nothing we can do can save them, right? I think that's a that's an important conversation for us as CTOs to have is to push back and say, you know what, that customer is not worth addressing. Like we'd rather address the other 99% of customers. Um, so, you know, certainly someone who's in your top 10% of revenue, right? You know, if you're, they're one of your top 10 most important customers you probably want to pay attention. There's someone who's a self-serve customer and maybe, maybe you don't, right? So that's kind of a judgment call. So I think that kind of looking at the aggregate use cases and kind of trying to figure out how do I set a uniform across the board service level indicator that measures customer experience is a more helpful thing to do. Keeping in mind that you still might receive complaints, but if you receive too many complaints then you may need to adjust who's in or out of your service level indicator. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Um, I have another question that's very similar, um, which is how do you avoid loudest customer causing it to fall apart because it failed for them? 
Uh, are you, is that a cascading failure question, or is that a surface level indicator question? I guess I guess the kind of surface level indicator question is, you know what, right? It's a business decision of who matters to the business. So kind of define success in terms of who matters to the business, and then measure that. Um, talking about cascading failures, I think that when we have Slack in our systems, uh, and I don't mean Slack the tool, I mean Slack like a spare room in our systems, right? That enables uh, customers to burst. That enables us to have more resilience if our systems can cope. Or sorry. Uh, John Alspaugh is going to yell at me for using the word resilience there. If we have more kind of redundancy and, and capacity to cope in our systems, that means that a large customer spiking is not going to cause us to, to go down. One of the main pains I see is when people overdo isolation. We call them multi-signal tenant systems. And those actually can be really, really painful to operate because then there's no slack in the system. Sure, you're isolated from every other customer, but then you're going to catastrophically bring down your own shard. So there are a variety of approaches and ways to approach it. Great. Um, yeah, I think that's a, a great answer. Um, another question is, uh, how do you set an initial error budget? I think your error budget has to be defined in terms of, you know, you can look at number of bad queries, you can look at percentage availability, right? Like, I don't love this because uh, not every burnout, not every brownout is a complete blackout. Um, but like things like, you know, would it be okay if our service were down for five minutes, right? That's an important question to ask, right? If you look at the numbers, right? If you do it by the numbers, I think that something like four minutes of downtime per month is 99.99%. So if your service can tolerate four minutes of complete downtime per month, that suggests that you have a SLO of less than 99.9%, or sorry, 99.99%. Uh, similarly, I think it's 43 minutes for 99.9%, right? So kind of looking at if it were a complete blackout, how bad, how bad would it have to be before it would be a serious problem? And then extrapolating from that to brownouts, right? If we had 1% of users down, how long could we tolerate having 1% of our, of, our, of our requests randomly failing? Yeah, that makes sense. Um, great. We have one quick follow-up question um, to uh, when you were talking about psychological safety and how Google defined it. Um, one audience member just wanted to know whether that concept was covered in the Google SRE manual um, that they published, if you know that. I think it's covered certainly in the SRE, in the Site Reliability Workbook, as well as in Seeking SRE. So three books I recommend that you read, uh, Site Reliability Book, Site Reliability Workbook, and Seeking SRE. That, that's kind of the uh, trilogy of SRE books that I recommend right now today. Awesome. Um, and for everybody that's listening, uh, we will write down all of these references and send them out to you so that you don't have to worry about them and they'll uh, all be accessible. Um, well, perfect. That is all that we have time for today. I hope that everybody listening had half as much fun as I did. Thank you so much to our guest, Liz, and to thank thank all of you for attending. Um, I'm Brittany Shear. You can find CTO Universe on Twitter at CTO Universe. You can find Liz at all of the contact information listed on this screen. And if you want to see more sessions like this, please check out all, our, all of our upcoming webinars listed on our site. Thank you all for joining us and have a great day.